and welcome to the Charles River Conservancy Parkland Show. My name is Renata von Charner, the founder and president of the Charles River Conservancy and today we are going to talk about the trees in Cambridge and we have a guest who knows a lot about them but he also knows a lot about what goes into the Charles and what's not supposed to go into the Charles. Welcome Owen O'Reardon. Thank you very much. Owen is the, has been the Commissioner of Public Works for two and a half years and prior to that he was the city engineer for 15 years and by background he's a civil engineer and a hydrologist. So a wonderful combination of expertise. <laughs> so um, as, we, as we always do um, in this show, we start with our wonderful map and we show the river which that's where the, the sewage and the stormwater goes and we'll talk that a, a about later. It also has a lot of trees along it but we will be focusing mostly on the Cambridge trees and um, so the city landscape and the preparation of climate change. I think that is yeah. really what we'll be focusing on the first part of the show. So Owen tell us kind of what the city of Cambridge what are the kind of type, the marks here that um, have influenced the work on preparation for climate change? Yeah, thank you very much, Renata. Um, so um, we in the city have been thinking about issues associated with climate change for the best part of 18 or 19 years at this point in time. If you go back as far as 1999, um, the city uh, joined ICLEI, uh, that's the International Council for um, associated with um, local um, environmental initiatives and um, the city council and city executive and city staff have been expressing concerns about issues associated with climate change since that point in time. Moving further along, um, if you go to September 2007, the International Panel for Climate Change, a um, UN-sponsored body, spoke about the fact that some aspects of climate change were irreversible and, uh, and some of the impacts associated with climate change would be very abrupt. And so if you think back to 2010, on a Saturday of 2010, we had four and a half inches of rain in less than an hour, mm. causing an enormous amount of damage to a lot of properties in the city. Uh, and so from our perspective, this was a highly unusual event. Uh, and a rainfall of that intensity had not been experienced in the city before, at least as far as records are concerned. And then moving immediately beyond that, if you think about October 2012 and Hurricane Sandy and the mm. impact it had on New York, I think we've all become increasingly conscious yeah. of how climate change is going to impact us. Mm -hmm. And so for the last number of years we've been looking at how vulnerable the city uh, is, and then thinking about how best we can prepare the city for the consequences of yeah. climate change. And, and you will be talking mostly now about what the role of trees are. Obviously there are many other methods of preparing for yeah. climate change, and we can speak of those. So maybe you want to tell us a little bit what the, the tr our tree canopies we have, both in the streets and parks and parkways. Yeah, so I can, you know, Trees are obviously very precious to uh, the citizenry of the city of Cambridge and we have a, a very large and um, relatively robust uh, urban canopy. We're about, there are about 19,000 trees in the city. Um, about 13,000 of those trees are along our streets and sidewalks. And the remaining um, 4,500 trees are in our parks and along the parkways uh, to include you know, uh, Memorial Drive uh, along the Charles River mm -hmm. itself. And so uh, really important that we continue to maintain um, our tree um, population. Again, this map is illustrative of the fact that there are certain areas in the city that don't have as much tree canopy as others, most particularly in East Cambridge. Um, and again, uh, um, an area that with narrow streets and streets that don't lend themselves readily to um, um, tree planting and something mm -hmm. that we need to continue to look at. Time yeah, time. so let's maybe look at um, at particular areas um, in the city of where, um, how the tree canopy looks like in particular areas. 
So this is, this is, this, these two uh, maps illustrate um, the locations where they are, are, there's the greatest density of trees in terms of trees per street, mm -hmm. and where the trees are you know, least obvious. So the, the, the map on the left hand side is an illustration of um, Cambridge Port and the fact mm -hmm. that Cambridge Port has a, a significant density of trees, density in terms of number of trees per street length. Well, if you look at um, in the um, Concord Alewife area, very, very few trees mm -hmm. in that area. In fact, 88% of that area is impervious at this point wow. in time. Yeah. So again, a, a, a remnant of uh, industrialization in the city. Um, uh, and so it's, this is a, an interesting contrast in terms of different areas of the city. Yeah. So let's look at the kind of the, the bigger picture um, in terms of, of vulnerability yeah. of... Um, kind of look at the different climate scenarios. Yeah. So w when we think about climate uh, and climate change and in terms of the study that's been ongoing, I think what we first of all want to begin to assess is how significant will climate change be in terms of just the climate itself, be it in terms of precipitation, in terms of heat, uh, and in terms of storms themselves. And after that, we want to think about, uh, given the, those increases, in, the increase in uh, precipitation, in the type and nature of uh, storms, mm -hmm. how vulnerable will the city be? And then finally, how, um, how will we begin to manage that risk? So in terms of temperature, the expectation is that by the end of the century, we will have uh, a climate uh, in terms of temperature similar to that in the Carolinas at present, so much warmer than today will also begin to experience much more significant, uh, intense rainfall events, which will give rise to more flooding. And also will be much more vulnerable to hurricanes and, and so on. And then finally, there's obviously sea level rise mm -hmm. and storms associated with surge events in the sea itself. And to kind of look at uh, trends, I think that is a very helpful to yeah. see how trends have changed. Yeah, I mean it's interesting to look at uh, the map on the left here which indicates that in the northeast of this country the climate's been changing or at least it's, there's been evidence that in terms of extreme rainfall events we there's there's been a significant change ongoing uh, if you look at records between 1958 and 2012. And then if you look at the bar graph on the right you'll notice that for example in 20 in the in 2070 um, the what is what constitutes um, a hundred year our 25 year event today will be akin to a 10 year event at that point in, other words, 10 years. indeed in other words an event that has a, a reoccurrence probability of once every 25 years will have a reoccurrence probability of once every 10 years a 25 year event in 2070 will be somewhat akin to a 100 year event today. Mm. So a significant change yeah. in the size of these large um, damaging rainfall events. Yeah. And so now let's look at Cambridge at some, um, at some scenarios, yeah. um, different scenarios. Yeah. So again, this is, um, we're looking at flooding events in terms of the present climate um, in this map. And as you can see, um, um, there's um, a significant amount of flooding in the Alwife area. Again, that dark blue represents deeper mm -hmm. flooding. But you also see a significant amount of flooding in eastern Cambridge, most particularly in the areas around Central Square, mm -hmm. indeed adjacent to where um, CCTV's offices are. So another area that's very, very vulnerable to flooding. Mm -hmm. uh, and similarly, Cambridge Port has a significant uh, vulnerability. Yeah. And this is, that was looking at um, the 100-year um, event um, um, in 2000 and uh, 2000. Now we're looking at the 100 year event in 2030. Again, the extent to which flooding occurs in the Alwife increases even more dramatically, but also the incre <coughs> increase in depth in flooding in those areas around Central Square and the Charles River watershed um, are also increasing. Yeah. And then finally, when you look at 2070, uh, devastating flooding in the Alwife area yeah. and similarly in the Charles River watershed, Central Square, areas around um, uh, MIT, uh, most particularly along Vassar Street, and also in areas um, in Cambridgeport are, are, are going to experience yeah. 
um, significant damage as a result of rainfall events. There. And you have, I think, some, some detailed maps here of, of areas. Yeah, and again, the last maps refer to flooding that would occur, at a, would have a 1% chance of occurring. In other words, in a given year, there's a 1% probability of that rainfall event occurring. This map represents um, flooding in East Cambridge uh, with a probability of occurrence 10% of the given mm. year. And again, so the frequency with which this flooding is going to occur is much more, um, it's much more frequent. And again, that has a profound impact on how people live their lives in these areas. Yeah, yeah. So I guess um, people might wonder, what does the, the city of Cambridge, what can the city of Cambridge do um, to, to prepare or prevent that from happening? So at the moment we're, we're we're working through the vulnerability assessment. The expectation is that in the next year or two, we'll collectively begin to think about how do we begin to prepare ourselves for that. Mm -hmm. The probability is that we will not be able to prevent the flooding itself, but rather how do we begin to think about um, becoming more resilient so that we can recover appropriately mm -hmm. uh, from these large flood events. Uh, and so that's something that we need to think about as a community over the next number of years. Yeah, because you, and, and this, in your capacity, you are also involved in sewage, stormwater, yeah. and that's probably where, where that, that element comes in as well. I, I, to some extent it does. Um, we can't convey f our way out of this problem in terms of, we can't convey the water away, there's just too much of it. But I think there are things that we are doing and will continue to do in terms of sewer separation in the mm. city. Uh, and what that will do is it will further protect the community in terms of public health. Mm. Beyond that as well, if you think about the Charles River, you know, the MWRA, the city of Cambridge, the city of Boston, has spent millions upon millions of do dollars cleaning up those rivers. So the more sewer separation we continue to do, the more we continue to protect those rivers because the plans are presently in place um, think in terms of historical rainfall events. Mm -hmm. When one thinks about the future, you know, the, the rainfall events are going to become more extreme and so we've got to think about further enhancing the programs that have already uh, been constructed mm -hmm. in the Charles mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in the Alway. I just want to show two scenarios here um, and then we will move on to, to issues of temperature. So that is... This is uh, inland flooding in um, eastern Cambridge mm -hmm. um, in 2030. And again, you know, widespread um, flooding because the conveyance capacity of our drainage systems are just inadequate to be yeah. able to deal with that amount of rainfall. And again, that's the 100 year event yeah. at that point in time. So the other thing that, um, the other parameter that's important to think about when we think about climate change is heat. Um, you know, flooding generally impacts uh, property. Heat impacts our health. Mm -hmm. More extreme, um, more days of continuous um, temperature above 1900 degrees, the more vulnerable populations are impacted, mm -hmm. the more people who don't have air conditioning are impacted. So in, in that previous map, you, uh, or in this map here, right. uh, or sorry, look, in this map, uh, where what you're looking at is those areas where the temperature is in excess of 105 degrees. Um, um, and again, that's... Um, the heat index present condition is hot. That's how it feels um, today. If you have a regular temperature, 80, 83 degrees Fahrenheit, um, um, in there are certain areas in the city that the, with a certain amount of humidity, where the the actual the heat index is closer to hundred. And there's degrees. a correlation here between where it feels particularly hot and where there's fewer trees. That's like right. So if you look at the Alwife area. Yeah. Um, very few trees in that area, and again, hotter area, less shade, yeah. so absolutely that's the case. Again, 2030, most of the city is impacted um, because of um, you know, those uh, greater number of hot days, four consecutive days, with a heat index in the order of 96 degrees. And again, you've got the feel-like temperature in the city is about 100 and, uh, over 105 degrees in the majority of the city. Yeah. And then 2070, unfortunately, if you've got five consecutive days with the heat index at the order of at 100 degrees, the majority of the city is going to feel as though it were in excess of 115 degrees. And unfortunately, trees uh, don't help us in, in these types of instances. Yeah. So now let's look at, at how you assess the risk. Yeah. 
and um, that is to, to put Cambridge in the context of the region. Um, there are obviously the, the Charles River Dam and the Amelia Earhart Dam, I think, are, are major risk factors. They are, and I think they provide a significant level of protection for us, at least until 2030. After that, uh, the Amelia Earhart Dam um, becomes a more vulnerable structure. And I think it's in the order of about 2065 before the Charles River Dam is uh, at more significant risk for overtopping and uh, flanking. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. but in the short term, they continue to present you know, significant um, protection uh, for the city of Cambridge, but beyond 2030 and 2065 for the Amelia Earhart Dam and Charles River Dam, respectively, um, we can expect that during extreme events, they'll be both overtopped and flanked, and so that will lead to more significant flooding in the community, most particularly in the Alwife area. Mm -hmm. and so when we think about vulnerability, we think about it both in terms of the probability of uh, being impacted and also the, um, the impact of um, that um, occurrence itself. Yeah. And so that's how risk is, is generally um, thought about. And we think about um, assets in terms of the built environment and the social environment, be it in terms of our energy infrastructure, our water infrastructure, or indeed our, in terms of the social environment or public health infrastructure. We think about vulnerable populations and indeed about the economic impact in the community. Mm -hmm. So these, this is how we think about vulnerability in the community. And we want to assess how vulnerable populations are, both in terms of um, how probable it is, it, it is that they're going to be impacted and what's the extent of the impact. Mm -hmm. And again, like I said, when we think about um, vulnerability, we think about exposure. How, how frequently will people be exposed to flooding? And then, depending on the asset, how sensitive is that asset to, um, to flooding, to heat? And how quickly can it um, recover? And again, if, if the impact is significant then, and if the probability is significant, then the risk is significant. Again, risk is a, a function of probability of occurrence together, uh, multiplied by the consequence of failure. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's how we think about it. So to look at how that now distributes in Cambridge those various risks. Yeah, and again, if you, if you look at the bottom left-hand side, there's a, there's a legend that's presented there. So we're looking at vulnerability in, uh, in terms of vulnerable, highly vulnerable, and most vulnerable. V5 reflects most vulnerable. And then we're looking at those indicators in terms of the rating um, a little bit adjacent to that. So if you look in the west of the city, um, in, in, the immediately, in the area immediately adjacent to the Alwife, you have an area that's extremely vulnerable where, um, again, there are um, elderly people and where um, there are perhaps there are um, pockets of poverty in the city and where there are, again, people who may perhaps um, have language um, isolation issues as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's how, this, that's how that's, this map represents those vulnerable populations and also indicates the extent of their vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have only a, a few minutes left, but you also brought some images of, of how um, trees um, are in danger. Obviously the tree canopy yeah. is absolutely crucial yeah. in terms of temperature um, and you um, have some images about um, of, of how um, um, of how the trees yeah. um, are are vulnerable to to diseases. Indeed and yeah. so we worked with the US Army Corps in um, studying the impact of climate change on our um, trees. And there were a number of different variables that we looked at in that regard, one of them being um, um, the Asian longhorn beetle. Mm -hmm. Again, with increasing temperatures, the probability is that we're going to have increased number of um, uh, species that will impact our trees, Asian longhorn beetle being one of those. There are about 6,500 uh, trees that may be vulnerable to impact by the Asian Oval people, including our maple trees, um, horse chestnuts, uh, and um, London plane trees. Um, and so something to be really conscious of. Again, we have a population of about 19,000 trees, so over yeah. a third of the trees are vulnerable to infest infestation by um, AIB. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know we, you have some other, you also have ash borne, and you have 
on how ice storms and yeah. so on affect. Yeah. So, but we unfortunately we won't have time to go through all this, these because I also would. We only have a few minutes left. I would love for you to kind of look at other aspects of, of your Department of Public yeah. Works, of the, the um, stormwater, of sewage separation, yeah. and new development, if you could address these issues. Yeah, I mean, I think we have a long-term commitment to sewer separation in the city. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about sewer separation, we don't just talk about uh, it in terms of separating sanitary waste from stormwater. We also talk about it in terms of improving the water quality of the stormwater before it's discharged to the receiving body to the Charles River. And you now have going to install real-time test stations. That's right. Yeah. And so I think we're the first in this region yeah. to do that. We're installing two real-time sampling stations on the Charles River and two on the Alwife Brock and the Mystic River as well. And so our expectation is that as time goes on, we'll begin to learn more about those real um, pollutant impacts on both rivers and then can further um, refine our policies and procedures associated with mm -hmm. stormwater management. And so I think we think beyond just um, sewer separation so that we think in terms of the long term and stormwater and how we can best improve the water quali uh, that water quality. Yeah. Of yeah. And certainly with regards to development, I mean, again, there are development projects happening throughout the city. We view these as um, opportunities mm -hmm. for us to further enhance water quality. And, you know, if you look at North Point, where again they've built a yeah. stormwater wetland. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's kind of be almost at the end of our program. A, yeah. a bit of an upbeat uh, component here. Tell us what we're looking at and how that might apply to other places in yeah. Cambridge. So this is an image of the um, recently constructed um, Alwife wetland. Mm -hmm. It's a three and a half acre wetland that was constructed as part of a sewer separation project in the west of the city. It's a wonderful. Um, a facility, it, its primary function is to prevent flooding, yeah. but it also acts as a resource in terms of stormwater, uh, stormwater quality management. Mm -hmm. It polishes the stormwater before it's ultimately discharged to the Alwife. And then finally, it's a wonderful resource for the community where children. There's an amphitheatre there. Yeah. There are boardwalks and walkways around there. There are overlooks where children and adults can come out and experience you know, the environment in a real way, yeah. you know, yeah. getting away from us. So we need city. to find ways we need to find ways on the Charles River to do that. Maybe in yeah. there already is a big is, is North Point has some swales but, and, and then it has a small wetland as well. And yeah. again, it's, it it functions in a very similar way to the yeah. Alwife wetland, where it has a flooding component, it has a, a water quality component, but it also has it's part of a park. Yeah, and maybe around the Volpe Centre. Who knows? Absolutely, there are opportunities yeah. there as yeah. well that we may, we may want to look at. Yes. Well, we're coming to the end of the programme. In case you just started, you can watch it on YouTube um, at the Charles River Conservancy. And I hope you'll join us some, another time about other topics, about swimming and volunteer projects. But I want to thank you very much for the work you do. This, we are we're very lucky here in Cambridge to have talent like yours and the city that really looks out for the for the our health and for our well-being and um, in case um, uh, in case you want to get in touch with the department and the commission of public works this is the contact information and um, and this brings us to the end of our show and um, thank you very much again for all the wonderful work you do and this was just a, a very quick glimpse over trees and a little bit about the, the water sewage separation. So thank you very much, Owen. Thank you very much.